So please welcome Daniela. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. The microphone is working, but the computer is not yet. Okay, so my name is Daniela. Uh, it's always a pleasure and it's always a pain to come here. <laughs> so talking about Antifragile, I'm quite uh, still on this way. So uh, every time I come, I'm always like excited, but I'm always scared about the previous talks, and it's always like a challenge to come up to the to speak. But uh, I'm quite passionate also about this topic today, so then I think it will be easier for me. Uh, one thing that I do every year, it's like, what is it my passion this year? So then I can propose these guys from DevOps days also that I want to talk about that. And this year, this topic came quite a lot into, into the, my mind, that is about security champions. Actually, it is security champions because this is what we were working with, but I would like this idea to be something that more and more we are spreading to the DevOps teams, and we use for different things. So then that's the reason that I brought it today. Uh, as many of you know, I work at Syntef. Syntef it's, uh, is the largest independent non-commercial research organization in Scandinavia. So we are for non-profit and we are also non-governmental. That is important for you to know. Even though we have a lot of projects that are funded by the Research Council of Norway, including this one. So uh, you will see that the talk today is based on many results that we are getting from this project. We started in 2015 with this project and then we are finishing next year. We are starting the last year now of the project. And the main thing of the project was that in 2015, many of the teams that were mostly agile at that time, they were, and then the companies were struggling with this thing of like being more scared about security and about software security, and more and more un unsure about how to deal with security in a way that didn't break the agility. So that was our challenge at that time. And then we started doing research because we couldn't find the books that could give us the way. And it's not that I found the way, <laughs> but we found ways. We found things that works in the organizations and some things that are not working. And then we are building an experience based on that. So the context of the championing that I'll talk here is in this thing of like software security initiative in teams that are self-managed. So for us, one important thing that we didn't want to break is the self-management in the teams. So that was something that was very important for us. And, it was, um, and it's very important to also understand what does it mean. And also, the more the teams understand this, the, better, the easier it was for us to get a security initiative with them. Uh, so self-managed teams are self-organized, semi-autonomous, small groups of employees whose members that mind plan manage their day-to-day -day activities and duties under reduced or no supervision. So, but that doesn't mean that you, like, we want 100% self-managed. I think that is a little bit utopic to think that we are going to have this, especially when we have big organizations. So that is a struggle that we also have to think. We have to think th that we have to find this balance of like what we want to be self-managed and what we want to be top-down led. And uh, we are also working with another concept that we call ambidextral security program. That means that you work on a top-down approach, but also on a bottom-up approach. So what we found out is that when we work with the self-managed teams, we have to find this balance of top-down and bottom-up approach, especially when we have bigger companies. And like most of our software companies, they are getting bigger and bigger. So we need to deal with the scalability of things. Uh, and also in that concept, in that context, one thing for me that it was quite like important, and one thing that I always thought about is, and then came based on this book called Diffusion of Innovations. Like in innovation, sometimes we just think that like, oh, something very new, cool, and that's going to break the world, and it's going to be disruptive, and so on. But innovation can be a small thing. It can be like, for example, in this case, it was the team was not 
use it to do security in their, in their pipeline. So then the security in this case is the innovation that we are bringing to the team. So to me, that is the innovation, security processes and the way of doing security was the, the innovation that we were bringing to the teams. And I also love, I'm a process improvement researcher, so I love to think about process improvement as an innovation. So anything that you are doing new that is going to, to change the way that people are doing things, you are innovating. You are innovating the way that they are working. You are innovating sometimes with using a tool. You are innovating all the time. Uh, but then, who drives innovation? So like one of the things that we were missing, and I still miss a little bit in, uh, in the DevOps teams that I work with, is like if we want to do something, who is going to drive this? So if we don't put the, uh, someone that is going to work on this, it, the, the probability that it's going to fail is very big. So most of the innovations, they fail because there is no one that is driving it. And like based on the research and so on, in a uh, then, then we think about a champion. Champion is someone that is going to drive this innovation based on the research that we have been doing. And then when you think about the champion, it's just like that person that wins something, right? But the other definition of champion is champion is a person who vigorously supports or defends a person or a cause. So in this case that we had, we needed a champion for security. Another research that we had done also was that we saw that teams were not dealing with security in the agile development because the focus was in functionalities and no one was fighting for security. So the developers were not fighting for security, we didn't have security experts in the teams, and then it was uh, a problem that no one was championing. So, uh, so then this, this is what my motivation comes. And then we started work with uh, different companies about this, especially Visma and FADA, in this case of the, the research project. And we have been observing how to breed security champions in these teams, and what we have done, what the companies have done, and this is what I'll try to share today. So this is a kind of a theory <laughs> that we are uh, creating. It's based on some other theories about how to create and how to breed champions. It's a lot of research in organizational uh, um, area, and then also in construction area and many other areas. They use this concept a lot. And then we are trying different things and see what works and what doesn't work in these teams. So these ones are things that we have done, and then I'll tell you what we have done and some of the problems we had by doing this. So the first one is about defining a role. So we, that, well, like I said, there was no one that was fighting for security on the team. So then we said, OK, we are going to create security champions. And then these security champions, we have specific roles that we want them to do. Because then we believe that if they do this, security will be going forward. You are driving this innovation forward. So then we, in FADA, we decided that we are going to, dis to define the role like this, that the person would seek for knowledge and technical and, and processes on knowledge and process and technical knowledge on security. Because if that person does, didn't know security a bit more than the other ones, they were not going to be able to drive the innovation we wanted. They also, we expected them to assist the technical activities in security, help with the adoption of the activities that we were planning to do. But one of the things that we also tried to do was to plan together. We had a very, as far as a very small company, so we have only five different teams. So then we had five different uh, security champions, and I was the one driving with them and deciding which program we were going to decide. Then also help on the process of self-management in security in the team. It was quite funny because when I said to them, you have to be self-managed in security in two years, they got quite scared because then I said, I will not be here in two years. So you have to find a way that you're going to make this work on the teams and you have to be self-managed. Of course, this is extreme, but, uh, but that's something that made them think and start thinking, okay, I have to step up. I have to start doing something to make this self-managed. And then, of course, you have to collaborate with others to be able to do these things. So security champions uh, collaborate with each other. 
Uh, so when you think about the role, there are different um, yeah, schools of thoughts on that. Some believe that you should not define a role for a champion, and some uh, think that you should define very well what you want from them. In our experience, it was very good to have this, because then when I would uh, recruit someone, that is the next topic, I would say, you know, this is what we expect, and it was much easier for them to say, yes, I would like to do this, or I don't want to do this, or discuss things of, I'm afraid of doing this, or not afraid of doing that. So it comes to the second point, that is uh, recruit and select potential champions. So that is another thing also that there are different ways of thinking about this. Some believe that in a team, there will be people that are born champions, you know. So they have all the characteristics and all the things that makes them leaders by nature. And then there are other ones that we can make them get this leadership role and this um, championing role. So there are different approaches depending on which one you believe and which one you want to do. And then also that will make you decide if you're going to just let it emerge in the team or if you're going to appoint them. So the case of Visma, it was like this. They have 300 teams. So that is kind of like something that you have to bear in mind. And then they had Aspen, that was the one driving the whole program for security program in Visma. And then they had like a, a set of uh, people that were working the security team. But then how to create this champion program in Visma? So if they would think that, okay, we are going to trust that the 200, I think it's 200, 300 teams, we have people that are born champions then they would fail. They didn't manage to do that. You know? So then they had to go through an approach that they have to get a mix of like emergent ones. So then they said to the service owners, you know, appoint someone to be a security engineer in your team. Then they, some of them emerged because they saw that there were some guys that were already interested in security. And then they said, like, OK, these are going to be my security engineers. Others, they had to say, no one wants? OK, you are the one. <laughs> so that's, that has like the benefits and the drawbacks of it. In some teams, we saw that even the appointed ones, like with the program of training and all the things that uh, Visma put in place, and then I'll talk also a little bit on that, they, they grew on the, on the role. And then they were able to do a very good job. Some were just saying, I don't know really what I have to do. I just know that I have to go to some meetings, and that's it. And didn't really get this to champion in the team. So then didn't work very well. And some of the other ones, the ones that emerged, of course, like they had already the passion on them to do security. So then that just went uh, very good. So the other thing also that uh, Aspen was thinking a lot when he did this is that he didn't want to create silos. So then the idea is that this is the security team. So it's not to think that there, is, there, are, there are some guys that are thinking a little bit more on how to drive the program and so on, but the whole team should feel that they are the responsible for security. So when you say, like, who is responsible for security in Visma, it's all, not, but not only this, but everyone. So the idea is that when you are self-managed, you also make, in fact, the whole team, and the whole team feel that they are the... the, the responsible for security. But the thing is that the security engineer, he should just help the whole team, collaborate with the team, do everything that you need to get security going. And then, of course, we have to set up communication channels. We got this also from the last uh, meeting, the last uh, presentation. So you have to think of like which are the communication channels that we have to create when we have so many things to do. So then like they have created Slack channels just for security engineers to share information, to talk about security, to share about incidents, to talk about different things that happens in, in Visma. Knowledge sharing, so then they have meetups. Each site, because Visma has in different sites, have their meetups and their OASP uh, uh, 
group and so on. So then they get together and then they just talk about security. So this is like, these are things that we need to also think about. And then like, for example, in FARA, that was a smaller one. Then we, had, we have also a Slack channel. We have also a security guild meeting, meeting where every 15 days we get together and then we talk about something or something that's going on in FARA or something that's going on in security. In the beginning, in the first year, it was quite a lot about sharing and making sure that all the, uh, security engineers had the same type of knowledge, that they were looking at the same things, that we had like a base, knowledge base that we all had. That's much harder to do when you have a, a company like Visma. So then, of course, then you have uh, different levels of knowledge and so on. Yeah, and then it comes to three other things that I didn't know a name to put on it, so then I put them together. And, uh, and then that is like this coaching that we do all the time. And then of course, like when you think about coaching, then it gets too much of a top-down approach, and that's why I didn't want to separate. But these, these things are quite top-down, if you think of. And uh, sometimes it's needed because in a place like in Visma that is so big, and even in Fara also, I, said, I felt that we needed to do that. That we needed to help them to understand what they needed to learn so then they could do their job well, you know? So, but of course, that doesn't mean that you cannot do this in a bottom-up way, but of, not the recognize the effort. But, um, but I felt like the, the security engineers now as they see, and the security champions, they see as a career that they can take. So then some of them are going more and more towards security career and getting more knowledge about that. And then, yeah, so then all these things, we have been working with them. Some of them are courses, some of them are just talking. Some of them are doing meetings together, doing security analysis together. So then they are learning how to facilitate these things and growing with the knowledge. And the last one that I think it's uh, very important, but actually, to be honest, it's the one that we are having harder time to do is to empower the champions. So in a place like in Visma, that you have a security program that was established and a lot of things are top down, of course, we also try to do a lot of things bottom up in a way that you listen more to the teams, you get feedback from the teams on what they are doing and so on. One thing that we were struggling was like, how to we move the security engineers from just executing the tasks that we were telling them to do to also start thinking for themselves, innovating also in terms of security and what to do of security. Because of course, when we think of a top-down approach, we think a lot of what we want to have with the security program. But then it may be biased. It may be biased by what you believe it's true, or it may be biased by what you think it's going to work with the teams. But I always say to, to us, and also in Visma, that we always have to go back to the source and do, to the ones that are doing the job. You are the ones that knows best. So then if we get more from you, we are going to get much more things going. And that's why I think we need to empower the champions and empower the teams as well. So uh, some of the things that we are thinking and we are trying, actually this is like really the most challenging part for us. We don't really have strategies that are working like 100%, but we are trying to think of strategies of like, how do we let the champions infect others with their passions? So of course, when we have this, this approach that we decided who was going to be the security champion, they don't have passion, so then they are not going to infect the others. But the ones that we see that have passion for security, they really infect everyone in the team. So when you talk to everyone, they're like, yeah, yeah, this is just how we do things here. And, uh, and then, but how to do this in a way that is more systematic, we don't know it yet. Uh, one thing that I have been struggling a bit and we are thinking of how we are going to do is this depolarization of the source of ideas. So my main struggle now with these two companies is that the ideas of what we should improve with security always comes from us, always come from the top down and say like, you know, we have to put static analysis tools. You have to do threat modeling. So now you're going to do threat modeling this way. Now you're going to do that way. And then, but we see in some of the ones of the teams that has this champion that were emergent and then which was totally passionate about security, that they have also some ideas that are very nice. 
you know. So then sometimes they try, and then sometimes they don't. And that's something also that I put in the flexibility, fostering trial and error mindset, because that is also something that sometimes we get very good on the teams and sometimes we don't. And especially depending on the country, we see very different to, uh, cultures in terms of how they accept this mindset of trial and error. So this is something that's like you, we see differences in the different countries. Here in Norway, it's easier to, to use that mindset, but in other countries, it's not so easy. So I, I, we are trying these things of like telling them, you know, just come up with an idea of what you want to improve. Or when we do meetings about, uh, we do retrospectives and charterings, we call charterings, where we listen from the teams what's going on with the different programs and with the different activities that we are asking them to do. And then we try to foster these ideas. And then we try to tell them, like, can we try this? And then can we try to spread this to all the teams and so on? Of course, there is always a pressure of time. So not always the teams are willing to do things outside of their own teams. So that is also a barrier that we have. Everyone has pressure to do functionalities and so on. So then security is not always the priority. They are already spending a lot of time in security for their own team. Then they think, ah, oh, spreading to other ones, we don't have time for that. So that's something that we also, we are also working on it. And then, uh, that I didn't manage yet to convince the companies to do, but is to allocate financial costs for the new ideas. So this is something that I really want to try and then to see if that is going to foster more ideas to come. How to do that can, could be like reward programs for the ones that get some idea, hackathons and things like that. But we are, I don't have evidence that this is really going to work to empower them. Yes. So, um, so then, like this talk, then you see what we thought we try to build, and then w when we see that, we say like, "Oh, this is a very good champion." These are some of the characteristics that we see on them. One is that they are driven by, by results; they really want to make the security work and make it self-managed. They enlist support and involvement of key stakeholders. So they work not only with the developers, but they work with the service owners, they work with people outside of the team. They, on the Slack channels that we do, there is a possibility to talk to everyone that is security engineer in Visma, for example, or in FARA as well. So then they, they get involvement when they don't know about something or they are struggling about one of the things in the program, they go there and they ask and they say like, who can help me with this? I'm having problems with that and so on. And then, so then they gather resources also inside, outside and wherever they can find. And uh, of course, like I said, our goal is to get them more self-managed as possible. So then like the ones that we see, of course, like getting setting all, overall directions, like all the directions is very hard, but we see that some are getting to set in their own directions of what they believe is effective for doing security in a good way. So like most of the teams, we, we are trying to move them from just executing the tasks to go more towards monitoring and designing. So that is where I really would like to have them. And of course, some of them I would like to get all the way. But we have to think about costs and how this means to Visma or to FARA. So then we kind of like try to find a balance on that. But I, the thing that I really try is to take them out of only executing the tasks of security. I would like them to think more and to decide for themselves and come back and say like, you know, this that you said for us to do, we are not going to do because it's not good for us. And that is what we are looking for. So this is just to show that we have uh, some, uh, yeah, some sources. There are all the ones, but these are the main sources that I use besides all the, the empirical results that we get. And these are the different activities that I am now preaching that I think we should do. And we will write a paper about it as well. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> do I have time for questions or? Okay, I have time for questions. So it was not rejected by the team. 
but it was kind of like no one in the team wanted to be the security engineer. And then we still have that. So maybe that is a way of rejecting. And then they were just appointed and then just don't go. They just do the bare minimum and that's it. You know, so we have teams where the security engineers don't even want to be, but they don't, want, they don't have anyone else that wants to be the security engineer in that team. Then it's kind of like they say, I'm stuck, you know. So there are cases that fail. It doesn't work for every team. Yeah. But we just have to live with it. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Maybe I'm biased, but, <laughs> but I think Norwegians are quite open, you know? Like, I, I don't know if it's because of this security. I'm not Norwegian. I'm Brazilian, probably, you, you know. Too. <laughs> okay. So, like, I think in Norway, you have this thing of, like, even in careers, and I notice that people are so easy to change careers and try something new. And so then they have this whole security behind them that make them try these things, you know. So I usually think that I see more in the Norwegian society that they are more trying things, you know, so then it's easier to get this uh, mindset there. In other companies that they are afraid of losing their jobs or that there is a strong authority levels and a, a strong, like, leadership that makes them not to try too much, then I think it's harder. But I may be biased also because I, I studied Norwegian companies for 13 years, you know, so then it's a bit hard for me to not say that. <laughs> Anyone else? Or? Oh, I don't see. Oh, yeah. So, usually we say one champion per team, like six to seven per persons. Sometimes they have much bigger teams, so then they divide this. So in FARA, we decided that it was one per team, but then afterwards we had like two for one of the teams because then the team became like 20 people and they were quite divided on back end, front end, and uh, yeah. And then they had Android and iOS, so then we divided for two champions. But usually we have one. One thing that is interesting that we did in FARA that I think it worked quite a lot was that in the beginning, the first six months, everything I asked them to do, they were like, we don't have time. And the product owner doesn't uh, give us time. So then we decided that we were going to separate eight hours per week that they could, that it was just pre-approved to do security activities, you know. And then the, the product owners accepted, and then we started working with that, and then things changed completely, you know, because then they could, and then we also said these eight hours is not only for you, it's for you or anyone in the team that wants to do anything in security, that you think it's the important thing to do now. And that changed completely, you know. So in Vismo, we haven't done that yet, but, um, but yeah, but usually we have one per team. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking the same. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking that the champion is not the one that is responsible for doing the activities. Yeah. So I would think one per channel. One. We are trying this idea also in FARA with what we call tech POs, and then we also establish it one per team. And it's working well. Okay, so may I say something else? Uh, in, uh, in Visma, there are cases that one security champion is for three or four different teams when they were too small, or when they were, for example, going to end-of-life products, products that were on maintenance and so on. So then we put like one for four or five teams. So that can happen also. So, yeah, there is a rule, but you don't need to use that rule. <laughs> yeah, okay. What I'm saying? <laughs> What's my talk next year? <laughs> um, we are we are looking quite a lot of about this co-petition that is about like competing and collaborating and how your the software teams uh, deal with that in terms of security. So then, what do you need to release and what you hold back just because of security reasons? So this is something that it's kind of 
burning now to me. But I still work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would you identify uh, the champion in a team like that? Yeah. So one of the teams in FAR, we have one security engineer here and the other security engineer in Poland. So then that's why also I created that. Because I felt like he was not able to really influence the guys that were in Poland. And then when I put the girl there, then she was able to influence them much more. You know. So I, you have to think about that as well. Yeah. But when you have totally distributed teams, I haven't done that. So, yeah. Yeah? Okay. I don't know if I understood your question. Yeah. Okay, so that's our big question. Big question. <laughs> we don't know. That's a very hard thing. Like one of the things that the security champions get demotivated sometimes. It's because they say, "I don't know if I'm doing a good job." You know, so it's very hard to have, we see if they can handle well or not, if they can answer well to the incident or not, that gives us indicator that like they are doing a good way. Or like now we are, okay, so then there is an, one thing that we are doing. In Visma, they are doing bug, bug bouncing programs. So then in those programs are giving them the assurance that like, okay, hackers are trying to hack us and they don't find much. You know, so these are the indicators that we are saying, like, okay, this is going a good way or not. But of course, not everyone can pay for bug bounties programs. So then, that is not yet one measure that we can say to everyone that you should do. You know, I don't know if that answers your question, but we are trying different ways that could uh, give us indicators that the security program is working in this team or not. You know. But the bug bounties quite like, have a lot of things. In Visma also, they created what they call security maturity index. That's a dashboard with different things of like how people are dealing with security. That then we give some indication, indicators and badges like gold, platinum, silver, and uh, so on with the different things that they do. But it's not really a measure that says like it's growing or, uh, or going down. Yeah, it's not like a quantitative metric. Yeah. So I'll be here, and then I'll be also for the whole day, so we can talk more if you want. So thank you for the talk. <laughs>